Today, we are talking all about food and the brain. We are going to talk about foods that are good for your brain in terms of focus, in terms of brain health generally, and the longevity of your brain, your ability to maintain cognition and clear thinking over time. So in general, there are two categories of things that are going to improve brain health from the perspective of nutrition. The first category is the general category of things that we eat and avoid and things that we do and avoid doing that will modulate brain health and function. What do I mean by modulate? Well, getting quality sleep on a regular basis, making sure that you're socially connected, making sure that you're not depressed. All these things are vitally important to our overall health. And of course they will impact brain function, but they do it more or less indirectly. Okay. There are a few things that happen in sleep, which directly benefit brain function and repair, et cetera. But today I really want to concentrate not on the things that modulate our overall health, but rather the things that mediate brain health directly. And in particular, how certain foods enhance brain function. And we are going to talk about how we can change our relationship to food, literally how we can start to prefer certain foods that are better for us than others the most important food element for brain function, and that is fat. A lot of our brain and a lot of the integrity of the nerve cells, the so-called neurons in our brain and the other types of cells comes from fat. And that's because nerve cells and other cells in the brain have a external layer that serve as a boundary between those cells. And that boundary is very important because how things pass across that boundary actually regulates the electrical activity of neurons, which is the way that neurons fire and communicate and keep you thinking and acting and doing all the good things that those neurons allow us to do. And those membranes are made up of fats. So what type of fat is it? And what should we eat in order to support that fat and those neurons? And the answer is the so-called essential fatty acids and phospholipids. Essential fatty acids can include the so-called EPA variety or DHA variety. You hear about omega-3s and omega-6s. Most people are getting enough omega-6s from their diet. Not everybody, but most people are getting enough omega-6s. However, most people are not getting enough omega-3s in their diet to support healthy brain function in the short and long term. Of course, you can supplement EPAs through various fish oils and uh, it could be liquid fish oil or capsule fish oil. However, I think it's clear that one can get a lot of EPA from the proper foods. And it turns out that those foods, not surprisingly, don't just contain high levels of EPA, but they also contain other things that are beneficial for brain health. So what are foods that are high in omega-3s that we should all probably be consuming at least on a daily basis? The number one is fish. So things like mackerel and salmon and herring and oysters and sardines and anchovies, and perhaps the heavyweight champion of EPAs per unit volume is caviar. Also, EPAs are found in chia seeds, in walnuts, in soybeans, and other plant-based foods. You can look these up online and you'll immediately see that there are a lot of sources of EPAs. It's very clear that eating foods that are rich in omega-3s and or supplementing with omega-3s to get above that 1.5 grams and ideally up to two or even three grams per day of EPA can be very beneficial for cognitive function in the short and long term. The other compound that has been shown to be directly supportive of neuronal function is phosphatidylserine, which is abundant in meats and in fish. So here we are again, back to fish being an important source of brain supporting food. Phosphatidylserine is something that nowadays people are supplementing. It's a lipid-like compound that at least in three studies have been shown to improve cognition. These weren't huge effects, but they were statistically significant effects. And as well in more than three, at least, at least five studies to reduce cognitive decline. And for those of you that are interested in supplementing with phosphatidylserine, it's a relatively inexpensive supplement that again is lipid-like. So it's mimicking some of the same things that you would get from food, but in higher concentration. After EPA, fatty acids, and phosphatidylserine, I would say third on the list of things that come from food that can readily support brain function would be choline. And that's because of the relationship to choline in the biosynthesis pathway for acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is a neuromodulator, tends to enhance the activity, the electrical activity and chemical activity of certain sets of neurons and 
downplay the activity of other neurons. So it's sort of a conductor of sorts leading to enhanced function and activity in certain brain areas and circuits and not in others. So having ample choline for production of acetylcholine allows for focus through, of course, many intervening steps. There are also regions of the brain in the so-called back of the brain, the hindbrain, that release acetylcholine that are involved in general states of alertness. And not surprisingly then, many of the treatments for Alzheimer's disease are drugs that impact the acetylcholine pathway and are aimed at enhancing the amount of acetylcholine that's available to neurons. But outside of the scenario where somebody has cognitive decline due to Alzheimer's, all of us are able to focus to some degree or not, or are able to be alert to some degree or not based on the amount of acetylcholine that we have. What this means is that making sure that we have enough of the substrates to create acetylcholine is vital if we want to be able to focus. And that's why dietary choline is so vital. And the primary source for dietary choline would be eggs and in particular egg yolks. Some people will supplement with choline. However, food sources seem to be the best source of choline. There are plenty of foods that are non-animal based that contain choline. So if you're somebody who doesn't eat eggs or doesn't want to eat eggs, things like potatoes, nuts and seeds and grains and fruit, in general, most people should probably strive to get somewhere between 500 milligrams and a gram of choline per day. So next on my list of compounds that have been shown in peer-reviewed research to improve neuronal and brain function is creatine. Creatine can be derived from meat sources. It can also be supplemented. What is the threshold level of creatine to supplement in order to get the cognitive benefit appears to be at least five grams per day. Now, the most typical form of creatine is so-called creatine monohydrate. There are other forms of creatine as well. Creatine supplementation of five grams per day, that's creatine monohydrate, has been shown to improve cognition in people that aren't getting creatine from animal sources. And there's some evidence detailed within the review that creatine supplementation can also enhance cognition in people that are also eating animal products. So I personally take creatine five grams per day and have for a very long time. I can't say that I've uh, noticed a tremendous benefit because I've actually never really come off it. Uh, and so I've never done the control experiment. I take it more as kind of a baseline insurance policy. Next on the list of foods that are beneficial for brain health is one that you've probably seen pictures of online because there seems to be a practice of putting pictures of blueberries and other dark berries next to any title that says, foods that benefit your brain. The interesting thing about blueberries and other berries, blackberries, dark currants, any of these thin skinned berries that are purplish in color is that they contain what are called anthocyanins. Anthocyanins actually have some really nice data to support the fact that they improve brain function. Eating a cup or two of blueberries pretty often every day or maybe you have blackberries or maybe it's black currants, that these anthocyanins are, are good for us. Blueberry eaters out there like me who prefer to get their anthocyanins from the actual berries, it appears that somewhere between 60 to 120 grams of fresh blueberries each day is the way that you can get uh, sufficient anthocyanins to at least shift your system or bias your brain towards these enhanced cognitive effects. So we've got EPA fatty acids, we've got phosphatidylserine, we've got choline, we've got creatine, and we have the anthocyanins. And the last item that I'd like to place in this list of food-derived things that can enhance brain function is glutamine. Foods that contain a lot of glutamine are things like cottage cheese. There are also other sources of glutamine. Glutamine is rich in protein-rich foods, things like beef, chicken, fish, dairy products, eggs, but also for you non-animal um, food uh, consuming people out there, um, vegetables, including beans, cabbage, once again, spinach, parsley, things of that sort. So those foods contain glutamine. For people that supplement with glutamine, generally they will take anywhere from a gram as much as 10 grams per day. There's also some evidence starting to emerge that glutamine can help offset sugar cravings. And I've talked about this on the podcast before. We're going to talk more about the basis for this a little bit later, but in brief, we all have neurons in our gut that sense the amino acid content, the fat content, and the sugar content of the foods that we eat and signal in a subconscious way to our brain whether or not the foods that we are eating contain 
certain levels of certain amino acids. And so we actually have glutamine sensing neurons in our gut. They're not just sensing glutamine, but when they do sense glutamine, they respond and they send signals to the brain that are signals of satiation of satisfaction. And in doing so can offset some of the sugar cravings that many people suffer from. It's been shown that glutamine supplementation can offset some of the negative effects on cognition caused by altitude and oxygen deprivation of other sorts. But the reason I bring this up, assuming that most people, including me, are not going up uh, to high altitudes very often, is that it's been well established that apnea, failure to breathe properly during sleep, can contribute to age-related and even non-age-related cognitive decline. And it's something to be taken seriously. I mean, heart attacks, all sorts of metabolic issues are caused by apnea. Apnea is associated with cognitive decline and cognitive dysfunction, even in young people. And it does appear that glutamine supplementation can offset some of the cognitive deficits that are associated with reduced oxygenation of the brain. So how is it that glutamine, either from food or, for, or through supplementation, can offset some of these so-called hypoxic effects caused by sleep apnea, hypoxia being a lack of oxygen for the brain that relate to cognitive decline? It appears to have this positive impact by way of reducing inflammation. I've been taking glutamine as a supplement, gosh, since I was in college, mostly because I felt either by superstition or by reality, that it protected me from um, various uh, flus and colds and things of that sort because of the purported uh, immune enhancing effects. And now that I've learned that glutamine seems to also have some cognitive enhancing effects, possibly, it's a supplement that I continue to take. I take very small amounts of it, but um, I do I take it on a regular basis. So that more or less completes the list of things that at least by my read of the literature, are things that are supported by at least three, and in some cases, as many as hundreds of studies in various populations. I wanna emphasize again that all of the things I listed out, whether or not it's EPAs, whether or not it's phosphatidylserine, whether or not it's choline, whether or not uh, it's the various compounds that are in berries, et cetera, all of those can be extracted from food. There is not any law that says that you have to get them from supplementation. Supplementation can help you get to the very high levels, the reason that I emphasize these things in this particular order is that they support the structure of neurons. They support the structure of the other cells of the brain that make up our cognition and that are important for our focus and our ability to remember things and so forth. And they are less so in the category of so-called modulatory effects. They will also have modulatory effects on sleep, on inflammation, or reducing inflammation throughout the body, on cardiovascular function, all of which I believe are positive effects, at least what the literature tells us is that none of these compounds are harming other systems of the body, provided they are taken at uh, reasonable levels. But everything in this list is directed towards answering the question, what can I eat? What can I ingest by way of food and or food supplement that can support brain function in the short term and in the long term?